Hi folks, this is Mr. Panola, and today we're going to learn how to calculate kinetic and gravitational potential energy, the two main types of energy that you'll be dealing with in this unit. Before we get started, let's talk briefly about energy. First off, energy can come in many different forms. Kinetic and gravitational potential are not the only forms of energy that, that you'll be learning throughout the course of your life. There's rotational energy, thermal energy, lots of different types that we won't get to today. But we'll talk about two of the primary types. Also, let's keep in mind that energy is always measured in the SI unit of joules. That means if you make sure that all of your given information is in SI units, as we've discussed previously, that means your answer will be in joules when you calculate any type of energy, no matter what form it is. Let's start out by talking about kinetic energy. Kinetic energy is defined as the energy of motion. All moving objects have kinetic energy. Take a look at the picture below. There are two horses in that picture. Both of the horses are moving. Therefore, they are said to have kinetic energy. Now, some objects might have more kinetic energy than other objects. Let's consider these two pictures. The man on the left is riding a bicycle. The person on the right is driving a race car. Now, we have to think about what factors affect kinetic energy in order to decide which one has more kinetic energy. You might already know a little bit about this, especially if you've learned about kinetic energy before. One factor that affects kinetic energy is the object's mass, usually measured in the SI unit of kilograms. Clearly, the race car has a higher mass than the bicycle, including the driver of each vehicle. So since the race car has a higher mass, it might have more kinetic energy if all other factors are the same. The other thing that affects kinetic energy is the object's velocity in meters per second. In other words, how fast the object is moving. Usually, race cars move faster than bicycles. So at each of their top speeds, it's probable that the race car is also moving at a higher velocity than the bicycle. So based on the fact that the race car not only has a bigger mass, but also is moving at a higher speed, that means we can pretty much safely say that it has more kinetic energy. But it would also be helpful to have an equation to calculate exactly how much kinetic energy each of these objects have. On your equation sheet is a formula that looks like this. Ke equals one half mv squared. The Ke stands for kinetic energy. The m stands for mass and the v stands for velocity. You will notice that the v is squared in this equation. That means that velocity is really more important than mass in determining kinetic energy. Although they both affect kinetic energy, velocity has more of an effect than mass does on how much kinetic energy the object has. Also, for reasons that go beyond what this course will cover, there is a one half or 0 0.5 that you have to multiply all of this by. The reasons are beyond what we'll discuss, but make sure you don't forget about that one half in the formula. Now I want to show you something before we go forward and use the formula. You'll see three equations here on this screen. All of these equations mean the same thing. In the first one on the left, you see the equation I just showed you, one half times m times v squared. The equation in the middle is the same thing. Ke equals mv squared divided by 2. Dividing something by 2 is the same thing as multiplying something by a half. Also, the equation on the right is one that's handy for multiple people as well. It says Ke equals 0 0.5 mv squared. 0 0.5 is just the way of writing in decimals 1 half. You can choose which one of these you'd like to use going forward. Let's do a practice problem with kinetic energy. Let's say that you have a 3.0 kilogram cat walking to the right with a velocity of 1.6 meters per second. How much kinetic energy does the cat have? Well, the mass of the cat was 3.0 kilograms. 
the velocity of the cat was 1.6 meters per second. Those numbers are both in SI units because kilograms is the SI unit for mass and meters per second is the SI unit for velocity. We also want to find out what the kinetic energy is, so that's why I write a question mark next to that. Next, we have to use a formula. We're going to use 1 half m times v squared. And then we've got to plug our numbers into that formula. So I'm going to move myself out of the way. Kinetic energy is equal to 1 half times 3.0, which is the mass in kilograms, times 1.6 which is the velocity in meters per second, squared. Notice that it was just the V that was being squared. So make sure that you're not squaring the whole thing, but just whatever the velocity is. I'm going to do that math with you here, and you can check it using a calculator if you have one handy. The kinetic energy is equal to 1.5 times 2.56, because 1 half times 3 is 1.5, and 1.6 squared is 2.56. That gets us an answer of 3.84 for the kinetic energy. But you might realize that we're not done yet, and that's because kinetic energy definitely include, includes units, like pretty much every equation you've done this year. So we have to make sure that we express the correct units, the SI units of joules. So the answer to this problem is that the cat has a kinetic energy of 3.84 joules. Let's move on now to another type of energy, and I'll move myself down again. That's called potential energy. Potential energy is energy that has been stored up. Notice in the picture of the animal on the right side of the screen, this animal has potential energy because it's above the ground. It has energy stored up. Right now it's not moving, so it doesn't have any kind of kinetic energy. But if it were to fall off the cliff, then it would have energy and it would pick up more and more kinetic energy as it fell. So it has potential energy when it's above the ground at the top of the cliff because there's energy stored up. The other picture is also showing you energy being stored up. The man has pulled back a fancy slingshot. If he was to let go, whatever object he was holding at the end of the slingshot would fire off with a lot of kinetic energy. Even though the object doesn't have any energy right now because it's not moving when it's in his hand, when he lets go, it's going to get a lot of energy very quickly in the form of kinetic energy. So the energy is stored up in the elastic band of the slingshot. So the animal in the picture on the right has energy stored up because it's above the ground and could potentially fall. And the object that the man is holding in the slingshot has potential energy because if he were to release the slingshot, it would go flying. So those are two types of potential energy. But we're only going to talk about the example of the animal at the top of the cliff. We say the animal has gravitational potential energy. We're not going to focus on the elastic potential energy kind just yet. Take a look at this picture. We have two skiers that are at the top of a hill. Both skiers, the green skier and the yellow skier, both have gravitational potential energy as compared to the bottom of the hill. That's because they are both above the base of the hill. They have gravitational, because gravity is pulling them down, potential energy. And that potential energy might get converted into kinetic energy. But let's take a look at the factors that affect gravitational potential energy. First off, the amount of gravitational potential energy you have depends on an object's mass in kilograms, just as it did for kinetic energy. It also depends on an object's height in meters. And when we say height, we mean height above a reference level. In this case, that reference level is going to be the ground. How high is the skier above the ground? And then lastly, it also depends on gravity. Technically, that's the acceleration due to gravity, but we haven't learned much about acceleration just yet. On Earth, that lowercase g value that we're going to learn a lot more in the next couple of weeks is equal to 9.8 meters per second squared. In this case, meters per second squared is the unit so it doesn't mean you need to actually square anything in the problem. 
It's just the unit. So let's do a practice calculation with gravitational potential energy. We need an equation in order to make that happen though. The equation on your sheet for gravitational potential energy is PE equals MGH. But you might notice in that formula a couple of those triangle symbols. And maybe you remember from math class, the fact that when you see one of those triangle symbols, it's actually the Greek letter delta, which means change. So all this is saying is rather than potential energy, it's saying the change in potential energy from the ground to where you currently are above the ground. That's why there's also a delta symbol before H. There is a change in height. The height of the ground was zero. The height you have now is a certain amount. So really, I wouldn't stress too much about the deltas in there, but it is in your equation sheet and you should know a little bit about what that means. So. Let's see if we can put this formula to use and calculate the gravitational potential energy of something. And we're going to calculate the gravitational potential energy of this light fixture, which is called a chandelier. So I'll read the problem for us. A 14 kilogram chandelier, or light fixture, hangs two meters above the floor in a house in Norwood. What is the gravitational potential energy of the chandelier? Well, we've got to start out by identifying what we know. The mass of the chandelier is 14 kilograms, and that's already in SI units, which is great. The height of the chandelier, or delta H, because it's above the ground, there's a change in the height, is two meters. Notice I use two meters instead of the six and a half feet, as this picture says, because two meters is the SI unit. Lastly, we know that Norwood is on Earth, and therefore, the gravity or the gravitational acceleration is 9.8 meters per second squared, as it is everywhere on Earth. We are looking for the potential energy or the gravitational potential energy of the chandelier. So I'm going to write delta PE equals question mark. So let's use our formula that we learned, MGH, and plug in some numbers. So the gravitational potential energy is equal to 14, which is the mass, times 9.8, the amount of gravity, times two, which is the height. Multiplying those out, we get that the potential energy or the change in potential energy from the base is 274.4. Once again, though, we're missing a unit. So we have to make sure that we say that it's 274.4 joules. Something to keep in mind before going forward is the fact that an object can have multiple types of energy at once. For example, the person in the background of this picture is operating a drone. The drone is flying away from the person, so it's definitely moving. That means it has kinetic energy. It also has gravitational potential energy because it's above the ground, or at least it has gravitational potential energy relative to the ground. So it actually has both at once. Sometimes the kinetic energy is zero, sometimes the gravitational energy is zero, sometimes both are zero, or sometimes neither are zero. This drone also possesses other types of energy. For example, rotational energy from the blades spinning around, or electrical energy from the lights that are turning on. So there are lots of different energies that are all around us. Kinetic and gravitational potential energy are two of the main types and now you know how to calculate both of those. Thanks for watching.